Hello ladies, I hope you're doing well. If you're new here, I'd like you to click the link in the description box and go and listen to this over on the post in which I will place more photographs and comments and you're able to leave a comment there too. I don't have comments on the blog. I, I just don't want too many things to monitor so I am making parking these here on YouTube and then making them for the posts that I create. And my name is Mrs. Sherman and I'm a veteran um, homemaker, homeschooler and I have got some things to say that might keep you company while you go about your work. I know there are a lot of videos to watch which show you how to do things but sometimes we just need something to listen to to pace us along when we are doing uh, routine things. Before you go I'd like to show you my teacup. Today is just one of those old Corel living wear or corning wear they used to call it. Almost indestructible. It isn't a fancy teacup, but my my family loves these. They stack so nicely, and they look really pretty when they're stacked with the way that the handles are curved around. But they really do serve a nice cup of tea, juice, water, coffee, whatever. And I didn't have anything today that went with uh, my dress or the room. And I'm in the guest room in which we have placed all of grandmother's old stuff. I've got her old furniture. She bought it secondhand when she was alive so that's how old it is and then I'm also using the same bedding, the same coverings that she had. I could never find anything I liked better to replace it and so we have created a, a little guest room here. I'm not sure which grandchild is going to stay in it, but I have a little basket back there on the bed that I'm going to fill up with some things that they might enjoy. Also, I have something to show you about, uh, you know, my decor and cushions. Uh, you might wonder, well, you must really have a wardrobe of cushions because there are so many different colors and you change it all out, but really I don't. I order something called a cushion cover. This one's in white and it's cotton. These are made in USA and they have a zipper across the top. And I can order the cushion covers, which a big stack of them hardly takes any room at all, and just use the same cushions over and over. So I covered that gray one you just saw. And you uh, can also use them and make your own and make your own covers. I thought you might enjoy knowing about that. It's just uh, not an expensive thing to do. And today, uh, one of the things that I want to tell you, there are three areas of this, and I like to include a few other things also. But the first thing, of course, is to get prepared for your day. It's not just getting dressed and getting dressed up and trying to look your best. It's also getting your thoughts in order and getting your mind focused. And I have found, everybody's different, but I have found just doing five minutes uh, of exercises. I'll go on YouTube and find somebody that's um, demonstrating exercises uh, for women. And I also have a way of adapting these exercises. If I don't feel like standing up and doing a bunch of uh, rigorous movements, I can sit down and adapt all the exercises. I can just move my feet on the floor and... and um, pretend that I'm walking and I can adapt a lot of their exercises to to seated but I do feel better and more focused and there are several of the teachers that will uh, tell you how much your mind is connected to your activity and how helpful it is to do some of these stretches and exercises and really you really do feel like you're not floating in life without any direction if you have something like this to do before you begin your homemaking. And if you have a problem and you don't have a list and you just really can't focus on a list, what I would suggest uh, that works sometimes is to go through your house from one end to the other and just look for things to do. And to teach your children this too, if they are meandering around and they don't quite know what to do, just say, look around and find something. Observe what needs to be done. And most of the time, children will learn well by seeing that things that are out of place have a place. And they can adjust that. Now, one of the th reasons I suggest dressing up is just from a historical point of view. 
back in the olden days, no one would hire anyone to work for them who came to work dirty, slothful looking, um, without their without the buttons buttoned up and the shirt tucked in and the laces on their boots tied because they they thought that the person's appearance had a lot to do with how they would perform at work and that if they had a slothful appearance they might have a slothful attitude towards work not that it was ever scientifically proven but that was what was thought but I think it's a good thing to take that principle with you into your home that how you approach your work might have something to do with how you're dressed and you can test this out you can um, and all of us have probably tested it out accidentally by noticing how um, much more upset people are in our home or how much we are upset when we haven't had a chance to really get ready we haven't had a chance to dress to uh, say our prayers and to plan our day or at least pray over our list and uh, I've, I got up this morning and I had a list that I just didn't have a hope that I would get done. But as my mind settled down with some of the other rituals that I had uh, to do, such as my exercises or my list, uh, I started to have a little hope. <laughs> so go from one end of the house to the other if you don't have a list and see what needs to be done. And also... You know, uh, there are several scriptures that I ran across that I don't emphasize these as much, but I wanted to tell you about them. And one of them was um, Colossians 3.23. This is all about uh, your hands and the effort you put in in your life, in your work. And Colossians 3.23 said, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You know, it's always nice to have people that we're, we're trying to serve and we're trying to please. It's nice if you get compliments from your family, from your husband. But what if they stop doing that? Or what if they don't? Or uh, what if they don't notice? And so you always have to have that higher goal to work towards. And that is ultimately you're, you're really serving the Lord. And... That's a really good defense, too, if you get around people who think you're doing it all for someone else that doesn't appreciate it or um, that it's wrong to uh, try to please other people. Just say, well, basically, um, there's someone else that I'm trying to please, and that's my God. And so when you have those higher goals, you uh, there's more motivation, I think. So that was Colossians 3.22. 23 whatever you do work heartily you might want to look up that word heartily this means from the heart as for the lord and not for men knowing that from the lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward i had that phrase in my homeschooling a lot that if they were to do well then they must do it with the heart heartily and i always tried to choose subjects that would delight their heart that would help them learn i tried to make it easy to learn and didn't put them through agony over education uh, so that it becomes very natural for them. And that's what I'm trying to do for you too because that's what I'm doing. I'm homeschooling you. And I'm uh, teaching you to be self-taught so that you can learn without having to have a teacher. And so then the other one was Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. And that is so interesting. I wish I had been taught that as a child. Um, unfortunately, a lot of us grew up with in an atmosphere where uh, there were demands, a lot of demands on us, but they didn't have the heart in it. And I think a lot of people were discouraged from being good workers or taking pride in their lives and in their work because they needed to have a uh, encouragement towards the heart and that's what i'm trying to do here now i was telling you about some of these readers mcguffey's readers and sometimes when i read them i think oh they're they're wasted on the youth let's uh let's make the uh adult women on my blog <laughs> read them <laughs> uh, because i think that you would appreciate it and 
I remember when my children were little, there was nothing. The homeschooling was just um, awakening, and there wasn't anything to buy that was for children for their school. And so I just ordered whatever I could from a, a book club or whatever I found, and I found these reprints of McGuffey's Readers. But we waited. We ordered them and waited and waited for them. We checked the mail every day, and there was nothing, and the kids would be disappointed And when they got home. And when finally these came, uh, I was just about to cry because they were so uh, unattractive. You know, they're just uh, they're so plain and unattractive. And I was thinking, well, I thought, because the way they're described, you know, as these deep, beautiful lessons and they will delight a child's heart and a mother's heart and and oh it would bond your children with you and it's the 1835 um, reproduction and this is what made uh, so many children literate and just this glowing description and so when we got them I was so let down because I thought that we would get something that we were going to be introduced to something great and this is before uh the the pretty nice and nice curriculums were being produced and um i was just thinking of uh there was a man named naaman in second kings and he was a general over a great army and he had gotten a disease and went to the prophet to ask him to um, help him tell him what to do to remove this disease and the prophet told him he'd have to dip so many times in the River Jordan to remove this disease. And and uh, I'm not sure if it was Jordan or the Nile. I'd have to look that up. It's 2 Kings chapter 5. <laughs> I think it was the Jordan. And the the general complained. He said, Behold, I thought the prophet would tell me something great to do, that I would have to do something great, you know, make some great sacrifice or, or do something great. Because, of course, he was a general and and um, the armies are great. And just this whole concept of greatness that we have in our heads today, too, uh, kind of make us miss some of the things that are really beautiful. So as a homemaker, I got to thinking about this. Uh, he said, uh, the, the general Naaman said, why didn't the prophet ask me to uh, dip in the river far, far? Because it's so much cleaner than the muddy Jordan. And so there must have been something in the mud. And uh, finally, he he had to finally dip as many times exactly as the prophet told him to before he was, uh, before this disease was erased. And then, um, and I'm thinking of these books and how disappointed I was when we got them and how I thought there's so much more there's got to be something better than this, you know, and I, I think my, ch- my child was disappointed too. Um, but we wanted, we wanted to make something of it. And I did let her color some of the pages in the early ones because they were so dull and I, I didn't think it would hurt them, but it reminded me of, uh, I don't know how many of you have the book Wives and Daughters, but Mrs. Goodenough Uh, she uh, and in the movie the series wives and daughters and uh, Mrs. Goodenough had uh, was one of the um, one of the village people and they had a they had a kind of a royalty they had uh, Lord Cumner and they had lady this and lady that so there was kind of a, a hierarchy there but the village people took extreme interest in these people Uh, these people that were richer and the rich people provided for these farmers provided a lot of their uh, yearly uh, harvest celebrations and dinners and their dances and their uh, they're just the big things and these people depended on these uh, this royalty in this town I, I say royalty they were a little above the farmers and they were farmers too but um there was supposed to be uh, Lady Harriet and Lady Cumner. They were related. Lady Cumner was the mother and Lady Harriet was the daughter. Uh, if you remember, Lady Harriet was the one that took Molly around and introduced her to all her friends. And uh, Mrs. Goodenough was one of the villagers. And there was supposed to be some uh, social event going on. And they were expecting uh, the du- a duchess to come that everyone knew. And so Mrs. Goodenough uh, 
had been waiting at home and waiting for the time when it was time to go to this social event because she was going to see the Duchess and she's really looking forward to that and so she said so when she got there and the Duchess was late she waited and waited and here came the Duchess and Mrs. Goodenough said is that the Duchess that palsy thing where are her diamonds here am I sitting up in coal and candlelight wasting at home and in comes the Duchess wearing tch. Farmer Hodson's daughter has a dress smarter than that. <laughs> and she was so disappointed. She said she could have at least come with her coronet or come with, you know, something fancy with her jewelry. She could have at least worn that. You know, I've waited all this time to see the Duchess and she didn't have anything spectacular to see. Well, that's the way I felt about these when they came. I, we'd waited all this time. We'd been to the post office, and I think my children were extremely disappointed, thinking, is this what homeschooling is all about? And they'd look at this dull little thing. But over time, I saw uh, the gold in it, and especially now. And I have read this story to you before. I have two stories to read to you today. So while you're working, you can listen to this uh, story. And uh, I want to back up a little bit and go back to those two scriptures I read where you work heartily. This is the philosophy and the belief that a lot of women had in the olden times uh, because I grew up in a time where women really wanted a shiny, clean floor. They cared about that. And um, that's why they always looked for ways you know we had ways of buffing the floor uh, and they were made of wood and uh, everyone just took such pride just made the mother feel so good or the wife feel so good and it was one of just one of the things that she enjoyed was having a clean shiny floor and um, income and I was I was in an era where things were changing and there was a lot of influence of the um, of the more progressive people and in comes people uh, from uh, the educational establishment and they would say things like is that all you women um, think about is having a clean shiny floor because they thought that it was more intellectual to um, think about world changes and politics and and that they looked down on anyone who thought that it was important to have a clean sink or a, a beautiful shiny floor and uh, they would even mock it. But some of these people who had come out of colleges just couldn't even pick up after themselves. They, to them, doing laundry and cleaning the floor was demeaning. It, didn't, it wasn't uh, important, and it didn't have a, an intellectual slant to it. But I wanted to tell you about that because whatever you find to do, I think it's important to do it with your heart and to do it well. And we, we found that there will always be those who mock and deride, just like they did Jesus Christ. They mock and deride these small things, the sweet things in life. And uh, if you get in a conversation with someone and they want to know what you do, right away you can see the prejudice in their eyes. And they assume that you're not smart enough to have a career or go to college and that's why you're doing it. But that's not true. A lot of people do it because they are smart enough to know that that is the most important thing. And in this sort of atmosphere that we're in where we feel all these outside threats um, and people are worried about what's going to happen to them, I think it's really important to focus on the house because then you can say, now wait a minute, I still have my floor, I still have my tables, I still have my chairs, still have my dishes. I can still provide a meal for my family. Just look around at what you do have and don't worry about what uh, they um, might threaten us with and so far I have not suffered any bodily harm no one has uh, put any handcuffs on me and no one's holding a gun to my back to make me um, do something so think about that uh, a lot of the fear is what drives people to do things and really um, the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord but I believe it means the respect just to respect the Lord. That is the healthiest thing, is this healthy respect for for God and for 
the work that you have set before you, that he has set before you. You know, the Bible says women should be um, keepers at home and also guard and guide the home. That takes some brains. That's a lot of work. That takes some courage, too, and um, takes some strength as well. And I don't think people realize it unless they... What's going to happen to all these... Uh, people that are that think they're so much more above all that when they don't have these highfalutin jobs and positions in life when they don't have it anymore and uh, they're going to be absolutely helpless sitting in their houses as they deteriorate because they don't know what to do so it's really important to pass this on by what we do uh, to the next generation they'll observe it and that's one reason I think we should have our children at home around us because if they go off to school every day, they're not going to see what you do. And many of us can attest to that. Many of us grew up on homesteads with hardy um, families that knew how to uh, build houses out of the woods and clear land and grow food and fish and take care of us all. We didn't know a thing about it because we were in school all the time and uh, being taught towards a different kind of life. And so I think it's really important to have your children around you. They can see what kind of life you had. We had a visit from uh, some children that uh, their grandfather brought them over to visit us because their parents uh, had to go somewhere. They brought these children over, and these children were almost teenagers, but they were so interesting to talk to. They knew what their parents did. They knew what um what industry their parents were in and they were told us all about it they knew everything about this business that their parents ran because the parents talked about it in front of them and they were they took them with them uh to work and uh it was so interesting to talk to them because they knew all about the customers they knew all about the problems they knew all about competition and threats from other other businesses that were similar it was so interesting to hear these children and um uh, so I think it's good to keep them around you. Now, um, you should also look at work at home not as a burden, but as a uh, something preferable to, uh, to something worse. You know, at least you're not being forced. At least you're not in forced labor. This is all voluntarily, voluntary, and you are free to be as creative as you want with it. Think about that. I uh, listened to one woman talk about how she handled cleaning up the area around the sink, you know, and how she wiped the faucets and made them shine and how she put a, some little bouquet of flowers next to it after she's finished, you know, like one of those um, bright touches afterwards and thought um, how much happier we would be if we approached our work that way, that at the end you get a little reward. And I thought that we should also approach our work with thankfulness because it's something God has given us. It keeps us out of trouble. It keeps us from getting um, caught up in things we should not be caught up in. Now, now and then, I have to warn you, as a seasoned homemaker, there will be people that will try to um, detach you from it. There will be people that will try to distract you from it. They don't want you uh, to be successful. And there will be people that will say they... Um, they need you to help them with something. And I have come to the point in my life, now everybody's different, where I think that um, it is enough for me to take care of my descendants. Already I can see I'm not going to have time for everybody else or for the church members and for everybody that claims to need some kind of assistance. They either have a husband, a father, a brother, a son, or or children and grandchildren or neighbors or friends and they don't really need to depend on the homemaker i've known for years homemakers have been sometimes used you know uh because some of the working women could not uh, take care of their children after school or they um, needed her to go get them something and uh, knew that these women were were more mobile more free but i don't think that's necessary you really have to watch out for that especially if you're the helpful type, you know, they know uh, they know how compassionate you are, and the helpful type. They can become you can become a target of someone who just wants to keep you busy, 
doing things for them because you're supposed to because you're a kind person or you're a Christian and you have to be very careful not to neglect your home or your own family or your own children. There will be, if you know how to sew, there will be people that will want you to sew for them. Uh, now they may offer to pay, but at the same time, you have only a limited amount of time with your children and energy also. And when they're grown, you're going to wish that you'd spent that time sewing for them, doing things for them. And I have known women who got into home businesses and their house is an absolute wreck because that business took priority and their children run around not uh, ready for the day, not prepared for the day and uh, just grabbing things to eat here and there and not, not ever having um, a stable home life because this business took over. And we just have to be so careful with distractions and with other things. Your life is beautiful enough with the regular homemaking, with the regular housekeeping. Life is beautiful enough uh, without adding uh, more things to it. And uh, I had a mother-in-law that was, um, she's quite elderly, and she, I noticed uh, during the times that, the time that I knew her from the time I first got married, how what she would call nonplussed she was. No one could shake her. Someone might say to her, you know, of course, there's going to be a great depression. Well, she'd already been through the depression of the 1930s, and so had my mother. And uh, you couldn't shake these people. And now I understand why there are some people who are not uh, in a panic over anything that the, uh, the globalists and the state and all these politicians do. They're not in a panic over it because they've seen it all. They've seen them do this kind of stuff before and fail. And uh, and they all they know that mankind always has hope, and uh, they could look around and say, "Well, I still have my uh, my children, I still have my husband, I still have my house, I still have." Uh, most of us can say that God did take care of us, but you could never shake these women. You would say, "Oh, there's going to be a, there's going to be a drought, there's going to be a food shortage, there's going to be gas shortage, there's going to be this or that," and they. They wouldn't have any meltdown. They wouldn't panic. They just look at their list and say, well, I guess I had better wash the dishes. And you know, there is no use worrying about it. And if you're listening to the news and the media, look, they're not helping you. They're not helping you get anything done. They're not helping you get that sewing finished. They're not helping you get your room redecorated. They're not help helping you get your nutritious meals planned. Uh, they're not helping you uh, teach your children or taking care of your family they're not helping you um, and it will not enlighten you uh, mentally at all it will just dull your senses and then you won't be able to you know did you ever wonder why uh, there are some people you talk to and you want to talk to them on a more spiritual level and their eyes are so dull and dark and blank and they can't you can't penetrate their minds they are so full of the world's um, knowledge and the world's media that they cannot there's no room for it so that's what you have to be careful of now i'm going to get to these mcguffey readers now and i hope that you're getting something done uh while you go um and that is uh these dull readers that i was so disappointed in because i thought well well like the duchess that she could have at least come in her diamonds. <laughs> I thought, well, it could have at least come and been prettier. Okay, so this is a story I've read to you several times, and it is the first McGuffey's Reader. I imagine a child would be in, I don't know, they weren't by grade, like this didn't mean grade one. It was just, they were just gradual. And, and so like, for, for example, the fourth McGuffey Reader, well, the child might be in sixth or seventh grade by then. Okay, so the illustration here, I'll show it to you, is a, a little girl, uh, and she's sitting in a basket with her brother, and it's the laundry basket, and uh, they're pretending, they're playing, they're playing. Mama, there's no uh, title to this story, it's called Lesson 15 or something like that, and throughout this book, there are slate work assignments. In other words, uh, you had to learn in handwriting and cursive and write it on your slate. Now you all know what a slate is, don't you? You 
pick up this clear piece of uh, vellum and pull it up and it would erase everything then you put it back down and you could write over it with a stylus of some kind and uh, so here is the story it doesn't have a title mama will you go to town well said mama what do you ask for a ticket on your train I think this would be a nice little play Oh, we will give you a ticket, Mama. About what time will you get back? At half past eight. Ah, said Mama, that is after bedtime. Is this the fast train? Yes, this is the lightning train. Oh, that is too fast for me. What shall we get for you in town, Mama? A big, so she replies, a big basket with two good little children in it because they're sitting in a basket playing. Now, isn't this just what a mother would say? All right, time is up. Ding, ding. Uh, and, you know, this is where uh, these stories are where children will get their ideas for play and where they get a lot of their early experiences. And there are people today uh, who will look at my generation or the generations before I remember my generation people accusing the previous generation of having ruined the world for them <laughs> but you know if you're a mother at home and this is all you're doing is playing with them and they're sitting in a laundry basket playing train you are creating a wonderful world for them you're not ruining their world you're giving them a solid childhood some stability uh, children need lots of time and you're giving them and you do too you know you it's not too late for you uh, we need lots of time to think and look and be quiet and be still and it stirs the uh, the thinking to play like this and you're giving them something very good because as the hard times come uh, in life these children who are growing up will not panic or have the meltdowns that some generations have had because they are not, not always in an upheaval. That's why I think they should be at home and have the time they need to think, to play, to rest. And this is just a beautiful story. Well, now I have the other McGuffey readers, and it's the third McGuffey reader. And now I'm not saying everything in here is sound because I could, as I was reading through the other day, I thought I see some. I see some potential um, propaganda in it. You know, they were trying to uh, uh, change. It's an eclectic reader, meaning there are different stories from different authors that was put in because they had some kind of value for the education of the children. And I could see some that I didn't like as well as others because I didn't like the teaching. But I'm not saying it was wicked or evil, but I could just see a source of it there. Now, this one... Uh, is called Beautiful Hands. I have read this to you before. I might uh, write out some of these things and put them on my post. So just like the, uh, a lot, the last couple ones that I read, I'd like to just type them out. Uh, and there's a picture that goes with this. And uh, it's a woman and a girl. Oh, Miss Roberts, what coarse-looking hands Mary Jessup has, said Daisy Marvin as she walked home from school with her teacher. In my opinion, Daisy, Mary's hands are the prettiest hands in the world. Why, Miss Roberts, they are as red and hard as they can be. How would they look if she were to try to play on the piano? I remember the old people used to call it the piano. Isn't that interesting? Miss Roberts took Daisy's hands in hers, and she said, Your hands are very soft and white, Daisy, just the hands to look beautiful on a piano. Yet they lack one beauty that Mary's hands have. Shall I tell you the difference? Yes, please, Miss Roberts. Well, Daisy, Mary's hands are always busy. They wash dishes, they make fires, they hang out. Now she's talking about building a fire in the stove for the heat. <laughs> Um, they hang out clothes and help. These were written in the 1800s, so they're portraying a more uh, agrarian, um, homestead-type lifestyle. They sweep, they dust, they sew, 
They wash clothes. They are always ready to help the poor, her poor, poor, hardworking mother. Besides, they wash and dress the children. They mend their toys and dress their dolls. Yet they find time to bathe the head of the little girl who is so sick in the next house to theirs. They are full of good deeds to every living thing. I have seen them patting the tired horse and the lame dog in the street. They are always ready to help those who, who need help. I shall never think Mary's hands are ugly any more, Miss Roberts, she said. I'm glad to hear you say that, Daisy, and I must tell you, they are beautiful because they do their work gladly and cheerfully. Now that's what I was talking about when I read those scriptures to you. Do it heartily. Whatever you do, do heartily. Oh, Miss Roberts, I feel so ashamed of myself and so sorry, said Daisy, looking into her teacher's face with cheerful eye, tearful eyes. Then, my dear, show your sorrow by deeds of kindness. The good alone are already beautiful. And, you know, uh, the only objection I would have to this is I would really uh, have changed the story to the mother teaching this to the daughter so that the daughter um, develops the values of her mother and they bond uh, both spiritually and mentally. And and while it's always nice to have a good teacher, I do believe we need to be careful not to hold our teachers above uh, the people God put in our lives naturally, like our mothers and grandmothers. And um, so, now here's something to remember. I'm going to read this to you because I talked to you uh, in previous videos about having little drops of thankfulness in your heart and they chase away the stress and after a while after you learn to substitute these little thankful things these little rituals uh, you're going to find that automatically when you hear some disturbing news or you read it you read a disturbing headline you just kind of shrug and laugh at it and click it off and um, So, to lift yourself out of some of the uh, dark times, the dreary times, the hard times, there are several things that you can do. And in reading these, I just got to thinking, you could, you could escape, you could have an escape mechanism. You could work in your home and make it beautiful. You could redo it. I, I often redo the colors and change everything out. You can redo your house, create a new atmosphere. You can also create events for yourself the way I have done. Remember we had a train ride. We had a an inn, a visit to an inn. Uh, we had uh, the butler's school. We had um, a couple of other things. Goodness, I can't think of all of them right now, but we've had several important events. Uh, we had the lake house, a visit to the lake house. And uh, this next one, I am not quite sure what all we are going to do, but I am thinking of nature. I am thinking of these last few days of summer, of uh, the nature basket and filling it up with things. I'll have a, a scavenger hunt and I'll have a list for everyone to go out and find things that are natural that God made and, and we'll bring them in and we'll make an arrangement in a little bowl and we'll talk about them or um, maybe look some things up and learn something. I'm not quite sure what all we will do, but I want to create a memory that they will look back on and say, those were some of the happiest moments uh, of my life. So, and you know, ladies, it's not too late for you. You can do all these things that, uh, that we do with the children. You can get yourself some of these and you can read them and then every day, you just read them and you, you can just be a student. You can be self-taught. Well, here's a good one for you. I know this is the uh, third eclectic reader and we think of the children being um, around nine years old. But look, this is good for you too. Maybe you didn't learn it. So this is called Things to Remember. And there are words to learn to go with it. Now, uh, my daughter likes to be a, a real teacher, so she takes, she makes them read the words, and she takes them through the words, and then they have to kind of find them throughout the text. I'm just going to read them to you. Uh, the words are prevent, forgive, protection, manners, 
satisfied, peevish. And uh, so you, you will notice these come up in the story. Things to remember. Now, in McGuffey Reader, every sentence or paragraph has a number on it. That way, if you've got two students or three students, you can say, oh, we're on number four, and uh, take turns reading the sentences. But uh, generally, with homeschooling, you just educate one children, uh, one child in one, uh, in one subject, and it's all his. Like, this would be all his book. Things to remember. When you rise in the morning, remember who kept you from danger during the, the night. Remember who watched over you while you slept and whose sun shines around you and gives you the sweet light of day. Now, ladies, this just triggers a memory or, or some little event, some big event that's been going on around here for decades. And that is we're, in a, we're on a farm and every farm has a farm road going past their house or their land. And sometimes in the farm roads, there's a little, what I call a little turnoff. And it's just a half moon shaped road where you can go in to the land and out back onto the road. Okay. So for decades, there's been so much noise over there as people drive their cars real fast into that little turnoff and back out again, or they stop and they, uh, they loiter. And some of them even, um, uh, spend the night in camp, you know, squat, camp on ground that's not theirs and just um, yell and, and drink and just awful, you know, and leave old cans and bottles around. And for, for years, I have hated the noise that they make at night and just the sound of those cars going in and out. And um, recently, it's gotten very quiet. So I thought, I wonder what's happened over there. And on uh, farmland, you can't really... Uh, get anybody to come out and do anything about it you know it's so far away so I thought I wonder what's going on and just about the time those bees were coming over you know and I was telling you about these bees looking for water and we were going through a drought here I looked over there and the farmer had put beehives in that along lining that little turnout there and uh, I pointed it out to somebody and he said well, that was clever. I don't want to walk through there. So uh, those bees apparently are keeping people out of that. I thought that was so clever. He didn't even have to call the sheriff. <laughs> he just put the bees there. And the bees, I think, are quite harmless, but they do uh, swirl around a lot and, and make a big commotion. And uh, no one wants to be bothered. They won't sit there with the windows down in their cars. They won't loiter. They won't camp out over there. Uh, and then we've had some peaceful nights. And it's usually in the summer that all this noise happens. So, Okay, number two. <laughs> Let God have the thanks of your heart for his kindness and his care. Remember I told you before, little drops of thankfulness. Just little drops of thankfulness. And we think it's silly because we've been uh, around worldly people who are so jaded and so sarcastic. They say... You're thanking God for that little flower, you know, like, that's really dumb, you know. But listen to this. Let God have the thanks of your heart for his kindness and his care. And pray for his protection during the wakeful hours of the day. You have to do that or you're just going to go around uh, upset about your own security and upset and debilitated by the constant uh, reports in the news media of impending doom. Now, there was a... Uh, general, his name was General MacArthur, and I believe it was during World War II. And uh, one of the reasons he was recalled uh, by the powers that be was that he had made a statement in an interview that there was always a uh, perceived enemy, and people had to be constantly upset uh, because we they wanted us to be at war constantly. So they created these new enemies. They created these threats and they uh, and it was just to get the money flowing for the machinery and uh, to make other people rich to uh, to keep war going uh, to make a profit for some people well he had made this statement that sounded something like always there is a uh, a created uh, an invented enemy to keep people uh, agreeing to wars and so of course he was recalled <laughs> And uh, 
I'm, I, I had heard or read somewhere that his wife was a very religious lady who believed in Christ, and uh, or it was his mother, I'm not sure, but uh, had an effect on him. Number three, remember that God made all creatures to be happy and will do nothing that may prevent their being so without good reason for it. That might be something you want to ponder on. You know, this isn't just for little children. This is for you and me, too. I think I should uh, homeschool you, and you should get um, McGuffey's third reader, and that you should do the assignments in it. Uh, and the assignments... Uh, now, as the readers got more uh, advanced, there were assignments and questions at the end. Uh, I'd like you to do that. When you are at the table, do not eat in a greedy manner like a pig. Eat quietly, and do not reach forth your hand for the food, but ask someone to pass it to you. Yes, if you grew up in a big family like I did, you were not allowed to reach for the food. You had to ask, please pass the, you know. And uh, it was quite a ritual. Um, and there was a lady on my blog roll years ago who had an article about eating politely on how to taste things, and it starts on... Um, the tip of your tongue and then and then goes back and how the saliva works and everything like that and I had also talked to you oh, several months ago about the importance of um, picking your own food uh, your own produce and preparing it um, and cutting it and 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 uh, just preparing it and even if you had to cook it uh, because it's preparing your appetite to smell it cooking that's really important it's one thing to eat at a restaurant but you're actually not uh, experiencing all the stages of food preparation that are important for your mind and uh, your digestion we miss out on a lot by being dependent on ready-made things so uh, and you can just think about that the way you want to. But there was also a lady that was talking about how important it was to let the food stay on your tongue a minute or two. And as you chewed it, uh, what to think about and, and how to manage it. Instead of just wolfing down your food to fill your stomach, there has to be more to it. It has to also feed you uh, emotionally. And one of the reasons people get into uh, overeating is that they haven't learned to taste and they haven't learned to eat and so emo they eat more to try to fill that emotional part uh, to some, get some kind of satisfaction from it but uh, also if you will have food that is closest to nature as it possibly can there's nothing better than going out to your garden and picking the peas and eating them right there while you're standing there in the garden or pulling up a cute little baby cucumber and just crunching into it there's nothing better than that that you can feel the life in it so even if all you have is a pot of dirt on your uh, porch or patio grow something just get started in something just one little thing um, so number five do not become peevish and pout because you do not get a part of everything be satisfied with what is given to you you know, that reminds me of Cain, when God said, why is your countenance low? Uh, pouting and peeving, you can almost see the, the lower lip goes out and the, the child is just disgruntled. That is the beginning of, uh, of bad actions and bad thinking, is the, the countenance, the look on the face, and that starts in the mind. And, you know, you can correct yourself, too, because... You look at the mountain of work that you have to do in your home, even if you don't have a family and you don't have children around and there's just you and your husband or just you. Sometimes, you know, homes have to be maintained. Even if you don't make a mess, they are going to deteriorate if they're not cleaned and if they're not uh, maintained, you know, things uh, pre repaired and prepared. So uh, don't become peevish and pout because you do not get a part of everything. Be satisfied with what is given to you. Avoid, number six, avoid a pouting face, angry looks, and angry words. Remember the hymn that we sing in church, angry words? Uh, do not slam the doors. Go quietly up and down stairs and never make a loud noise about the house. Do you remember in Wives and Daughters when Cynthia first came to live uh, 
with Molly, uh, Cynthia and her mother, because her father remarried, was a widower, and he remarried. And Molly was used, used to just a normal uh, communication, normal life and everything. And all of a sudden, she's so shocked because this sister of hers, the stepsister, uh, weeps and slams doors and uh, creates a big commotion and and then she won't come out of her room and she has uh, all kinds of mood swings and um, she makes noise and Molly's just like uh, the deer in headlights you want to watch that scene and see how her quiet passive little world is interrupted by this uh, s woman who makes a scene uh, over everything and uh, I think it's worth watching because if you've got a daughter or even a son, you can say, okay, let's analyze this scene and see what's going on. This girl uh, has become peevish and pouts and um, slams doors and uh, is letting her emotions be on her sleeves and making everybody else miserable too. Um so number seven, be kind and gentle in your manners, not like the howling winter storm, but like the bright summer morning. Oh, compare those two things. Now that would be a nice art lesson. Uh, take your crayons and make a howling winter storm on a one piece of art paper and then a bright summer morning on the other. See what we come up with here. Uh, I always like to, uh, if I'm going to tell the children to color something or draw something and take them through some pictures or a magazine and, and show them examples of what it might look like. But that's a that's a uh, very good comparison. comparison. A howling winter storm. What is your countenance and your attitude? A howling winter storm or a bright summer morning? You know that would that bright summer morning will just keep you young forever. <laughs> Number eight, do always as your parents bid you and obey them with a ready mind and a pleasant face. Do you know that that prevents the parents from uh, setting up a hard heart towards their children? If, if the children are pleasant and cooperative, then uh, the parent doesn't tend to bear down as hard. And you'll notice this with any kind of authority. If you're kind and you're, uh, you don't appear to be resistant, uh, they uh, relax a little more. I, I don't quite know how to describe that, but uh, to remember, um, I was going to bring up another scene in uh, Wives and Daughters. Um, when Squire Hamley found out that his son was engaged to Cynthia, which was the stepdaughter that had come, uh, he said, I don't know anything about her. What is she like? Is she like Molly, always ready to help someone? <laughs> and, uh, okay, so number nine. Never do anything you would be afraid or ashamed that your parents should know. That means don't go sneaking behind their back and doing things or think, uh, believing things that you know aren't, aren't right. Remember, if no one else sees you, God does from whom you cannot hide even your most secret thought. Number 10. At night, before you go to sleep, think whether you have done anything that was wrong during the day and pray to God to forgive you. See, that gives us a chance to straighten things out, doesn't it? The world never forgives. They keep a record of wrong forever and ever, and some people do too. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, overlook a, a fault at all. Worldly people don't. They'll keep something you did that they'll remind you, you know, 30 years later. Um, but you get to make it right at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day. If anyone has done you wrong, forgive him in your heart. Because, you know, they're just human beings. They're just people. 11. If you have not learned something useful or been in some way useful during the past day, you know what I think this is? I think this was written by George Washington. I really do. Or else it was put in his notebook because they had these commonplace notebooks and it was in a book about George Washington. It was in there, but I believe that they copied a lot of these things and it was part of their uh, commonplace books. 
Uh, but yes, this was in George Washington's book. If you have not learned something useful, see, I've been trying to tell you kids, just learn something every day. Tell, tell me something on uh, the comments that you learned every day. I had something I was going to tell you. I promptly forgot what it was. If you have not learned something useful or been in some way useful during the past day, think that it is a day lost and be very sorry for it. Yeah, you know, as you get older, you realize you can't recall those days. They cannot come back. Number 12. Trust in the Lord, and he will guide you in the way of good men. The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. There they've quoted a scripture. 13. We must do all the good we can to all men, for this is well-pleasing in the sight of God. He delights to see his children walk in love and do good one to another. So, ladies, uh, some of this is pretty good. You know, you could eclectic just means a sorted variety. You could just write your own and put things in it that you would like uh, you to learn uh, and create your own. Um, mostly, this is about uh, adventures that children had back in the 1800s that you probably probably a child would not relate to today and you probably wouldn't want him to go jump in the river today uh, this was about rural children so if I could lift uh, lift myself out of any kind of oppression I would uh, write stories or do assignments now what an assignment is is it makes uh, something more meaningful I might have a book there or a magazine I bought years ago that has an activity in there that I just thought was so interesting. And I just flip through it and kind of look at it, you know, and put it away. Well, now I'm picking them up and I'm saying, okay, I'm just going to put a marker in there and make it into an assignment. I'm going to try to do it. Now, it doesn't mean that I will uh, actually succeed, but I'm going to make an attempt because it gives it, uh, it, gives it more meaning to have a, like a, uh, a list of things to do that you, that are necessary for running the home today gives it more meaning if you have uh, some kind of organized list or if you have made assignments for yourself. It just uh, brings it to uh, more importance. Now, being self-taught means that you must tell you what to do. I know a lot of people have mentioned uh, mentors. They want a mentor, but what they really want is someone to tell them what to do. And uh, they enjoy this. But what if you didn't have anybody? Then you're going to have to be self-taught. So you're going to have to write your list down and then obey it. And I was talking to a dear friend the other day, and I asked her what she was doing. She says, I'm, I've made a list, and I'm doing it. I'm obeying my list. And um, so if you could try to do that, it gives a little, it gives a lot more meaning to your homemaking, and you can get a lot further. Now. I think it's really important not to rush through everything uh, just so you can go somewhere, just so uh, you can get it out of the way. But I think one of the secrets to the happy, happiest homemakers are the ones that are enjoying uh, the routine, enjoying their work, enjoying the uh, idea that of this being their career. And one of the things that is the hardest to do is live in the same place that you work. And, uh, but I'm becoming myself, becoming more aware of the messes I make that's creating work for myself. And I'm being more careful about everything. So in your life today, try having a little prayer, a little preparation, a bit of rest, a bit of exercise, some work, um, some personal interests, and a little nature. So ladies, I hope that you will do well today and I hope that those of you who are new here leave me a comment and uh, another thing I just want to warn you about one more thing and that is uh, to avoid a fatalistic view of life. I've seen this and I get texts from old friends too that, that have this attitude that uh, well, nothing's going to change. Nothing's ever going to change. It's always been bad. It always will be bad. And uh, in the past, I've known people in the previous generations that had this attitude. This is not good. 
Uh, remember, I've quoted this to you before when the uh, spies that were sent into Canaan to spy out the land to see if uh, it could be conquered. The ones that came back and said, oh, there's giants in the land and this is bad and that's bad. God was not pleased with them. He only sent the ones into the land to get the victory who said, well, we can do it. With God, we can do it. So uh, this fatalistic attitude is really bad, especially in the home. It won't work if you want to have uh, happy, successful children and a, uh, a home life that is uh, enjoyable. You cannot have that fatalistic attitude. Now, when I say fatalism, it was a religion of uh, ancient times, meaning that you would just sit in your house and let the roof cave in because the uh, it, it was the way it's supposed to be. It's just natural. You just you couldn't do anything about anything. You would let people be harmed. You would let uh, things go on that weren't right because it's it's a passive attitude is what it is so fatalism is not good and there's no point in you praying to god for something and then just saying well it'll probably never happen that's really wrong we can't we can't be like that um we have to be interactive with god and so we we go for a walk and we talk with him and we pray for what our deepest desires in our hearts are and the things that we want him to protect us from and the uh, way we would would like for our children to um, develop, we pray for those things. But there's, uh, I don't understand why people want to s say they pray for them, but they don't believe it. That they must be following a a very vain uh, philosophy, an in vain philosophy. So I wanted to warn you about that. And so you can always listen to this again and uh, take some notes and think about how you want to do things. And so, ladies, I hope that you have a good day today. Thanks for coming, and I am blessed that you have uh, chosen to spend your time at work listening to this. So I'll talk to you later. Bye.